I've never gotten up and gone to work ever. Not one day in my life. It's just life. It's just what you do. I am Carl Hartley, co-owner of Tom Hartley Cars, the largest hyper super classic car dealership in Europe. We are now a brand. People want to come and buy a car from Tom Hartley Cars because everyone's heard of it. It's not all roses. One of the first cars that I'd lost a considerable amount of money in, I realized that this is not a game. This is real. We were brought up, me and my brother, very like regimented. If it was a weekend, you go to work. What are you doing sitting in the house? Come on, you go to work. What are you doing? You're like, Dan, I'm, I'm eight. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like when someone sets a goal, they leave space to fail. When you treat something as a necessary, you put more pressure on yourself. And if you believe it can happen, it can happen. And remember, if you need help with your digital marketing services, get in touch with my agency, Tweak. We offer everything you could possibly need to help accelerate your business to the next level. Carl Hartley, I must have had more requests to have you on this podcast than any other guest I've seen the audience asking for in the comments. So no doubt the majority of our audience will already know a lot about who they think you are and what you do. Well, here by popular demand. So my opening question is I pose to all guests. Carl, in your own words, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I am Carl Hartley, um, co-owner of Tom Hartley Cars, and we are the largest hyper super classic car dealership in Europe and normally I ask a guest to pick a moment in time something really profound from their youth or their upbringing so they're like yes that moment that was what sent me on that trajectory to get to where I am today or had the journey that I've had up to now however with you I've got more of a feeling that it could have just been running through your veins is that how you feel yeah we was um born Born to do this. You really did get that feeling from, from day one. What, yeah. what was your earliest memory of a deal or a car or something that you really understood because you were old enough to, for you to understand? Oh, it's, it's like one of those things where um, I used to go to, to primary school. I left school after primary school uh, because by then I was quite heavily involved in the business and felt like I was wasting time at school. But I remember when I was a kid, like my son's age, I've got a son who's five years old and two daughters. And I'd come back from school and I wouldn't go into the house and watch cartoons or TV or play a PlayStation or anything. I'd go to my dad's office and I had a little chair in my dad's office that was like kind of the size of a five-year-old's chair. And I should just sit and just watch him do deals. And I was interested because I knew... The, the the silver Lamborghini Diablo that we'd had for a couple of weeks. My dad was close to selling it two or three days before and he'd just done a deal on it. He just sold it and like it would make me happy that, you know, I witnessed that kind of thing. And it was never like, there was never a first time if that makes sense. It was just, that's just how it happened. And it's funny, all the guys that are currently into cars, it seems like the content we love is following a story or a journey. Look at the success of Matt Armstrong taking a crash damaged car and rebuilding it back to how it should be. People love to follow the journey of something happening. It almost seems that when you were younger, you were around journeys that were happening all the time. Mm -hmm. Some of them might take two minutes on the phone. Some of them might take two weeks to get used to. You mentioned that silver Lamborghini Diablo sat in the corner of that office. When was it that you thought you were able to get into the office and actually be the one on the phone how did that kind of <laughs> i was always chomping at the bit forever but um because my knowledge on on cars and on prices was as good as anybody as good as any of my, my dad's salesmen who worked for him at the time my knowledge at nine years old far succeeded theirs um but being a salesman or being a buyer at that point with a nine-year-old's voice um, is a is a huge handicap to have someone who's spending that kind of money or wants to sell something for that kind of money doesn't necessarily want to talk to a child you know it's not a game although we weren't playing games it kind of I could see how it could come across a bit of a game like oh here I'll speak to my son he's nine 
you know, it's it's so it, it was a, it was a slow process, and it was a process that my dad I would go everywhere with him, and he would introduce me to customers, and he would say, "Oh, this is my son Carl," and I'd meet them and talk to them, and I'd look around the car, and my dad would ask me my opinion on the spot in front of the client what I thought their car was worth. So, if you fuck that up at nine years old and you say the car's worth one hundred and seventy thousand, and my dad wants to give one hundred and fifty thousand for it, then You've messed up the whole deal, but that's how you learn. And that was the responsibility that I had. But my dad also knew the knowledge that I had at the time was capable enough to do that. And that was simply just from absorbing everything that there was around you in this space. And what's been quite nice is my favorite guests or favorite conversations that I usually have are usually the ones where I've had years to either watch that individual or known that individual or or seen something develop because I can always refer to it or look back. And what was really nice is my first memory of coming in the gates of the estate here was actually before I had a driver's license in the passenger seat of my dad's car, who I did everything with Mm -hmm. um, growing up and we came to visit i think it was a summer barbecue or mm-hmm. something along those lines of a supercar driver but that was before i even had a license we're now sat here i think nine years on which is incredible but back then you didn't have the amazing showroom that we'll talk about that's mm-hmm. been built the estate looked very different but it's been amazing to see how that's come on and also how you've come on because i think my perception of you maybe back then was different even so to what it is now because you're a lot more younger out there flipping yeah. a ventador one-handed on the wheel yeah. shifting <laughs> and all the rest of it where it seems like you just are the epitome of the suave smooth salesman now well, you, you grow up eventually showroom. don't you when that voice had uh come through the balls had dropped and you're on the end of that telephone really doing deals was there one that stood out when you were younger that really made it all feel very, very real? Or do you remember one? No, that yeah, you no, normally up I can't that? remember one in particular, but normally it's the bad deals that stand out that make things very, very real. You know, it's okay enjoying and celebrating the good deals, but until something goes not according to plan or until you lose money, things are very real then. And that's when it was probably one of the first cars that I'd, I'd lost. A considerable amount of money in that I realized that this is not a game this is this has cost me xyz this is real and this also isn't a job this is life um so yeah it was probably not not the answer that you expected you probably want me to say yeah I remember when I'd done this and done that and sold it for this much but it's the ones that are not good deals or situations that are not an ideal situation that makes things real I think something that you'll be able to relate on versus me, and it's just worth giving a tiny bit of backstory, is I grew up in a family business that was started when I was born. They weren't there. Ended up doing quite well, and I was fortunate enough that after my dad passed, I was able to sell that business and crack on with life. And the experience I've had from my dad almost not being um, around anymore and passing away versus what it was like working when he was alive and it's funny because I worked just as hard in paving direct and in the family business as I did after he passed away but I get treated completely differently on either side of the fence and I always had to grow up with just these comments or people online not even directly at it just um you know oh it's all right for you or it's daddy's money all the rest of it. and it really I feel like I can say it because I've been through it. It it really used to grate on me. And I'd see some YouTube creators just pointing out constantly, oh, well, you know, it's fine for them. And I think, well, these are the cards that you've been dealt when when you kind of crack on. And you've obviously grown up with somebody that's unbelievably knowledgeable, has given you an amazing amount of training. Did stuff like that ever affect you? Um, Not really. I mean, I suppose growing up, um, if you were ever in a dispute with somebody... um, that would be the first thing that someone could say or would say. Um, but you know what? It's what, what's the saying? Why? Why? Why is a lion bothered about what a sheep thinks? You know why? Why would I care? I don't care if, if it was someone who I respected and somebody who I was maybe friends with or or, or close with, and they threw out a comment like that, then it would hurt me more. But as a stranger, why do I care what a stranger thinks of me? Do you want to win a car completely for free? Of course you do, right? Well, previous guest of the podcast, Calvin's Car Diary, runs Planet of Dreams, where they give away a car every Friday 
totally for free. Literally, all you have to do is follow Planet of Dreams and Calvin's Car Diary on Instagram and subscribe to Calvin's Car Diary on YouTube. The craziest part is when Calvin came on this podcast last year, a winner actually found out he'd won the car by Calvin mentioning on the podcast he couldn't get hold of the guy. It turned out the guy was listening to that very podcast and ended up going and picking up his Hyundai i30N at the end of the week. So what have you got to lose? It's literally three taps on your phone, automotive content that you will love, and the chance of winning a car every single week for free. Best of luck. Back to the episode. I actually think from from the outside and when I actually speak to kind of or, or just hear, you know, in the car scene, you, you build up who likes who and what's and, and what who thinks of it. And I don't think anybody would ever doubt your tenacity, how you've built the business alongside that. I've taken it to the next level. People love to deal with you. Some people probably love to still deal with your dad because it's two yeah. different personalities. But that always was something for me that I couldn't believe when that moment happened, how different it was on either side but sometimes it's very difficult growing growing up in that environment the only bit that i struggled to grasp and only got only got after um he passed away for me was truly understanding the value of money because suddenly it was so unbelievably real you've actually mentioned that you were brought into the business as a co-owner of of the group because you're doing so much both doing it together when did that happen as part of the journey well um I went to school, I went to primary school and I went there until I was 11 years old and it was time to leave and go to secondary school and I spent more days probably out of primary school than what I did in primary school. I used to have a stomach ache the first Tuesday of every month <laughs> and I used to find myself down Misham BCA car auctions because that was the top, top car auction was the first Tuesday of every month. So, miss, I've got a stomach ache, I need to go home. But it was pre-organized with one of my drivers that I had here at the time. I'm like, hey, give me to 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Pick me up. We're going to Misha. I'm going to buy some cars. Um, and then, you know, my dad seen that happen. And he's not stupid. Obviously, we lived in the same house. And he kind of, he kind of, although we've never really had this conversation, he, he kind of put a blind eye to it because I think he was quite proud that I was doing that kind of thing. Um, so when it come time to you know move on to the next chapter i was like look i'm not I, i'm not going to school I don't want to go to school i don't want to go to school anymore you know i i'm i'm in the business i'm losing money by being in school i want to be in i want to be in the business so he turned around to me and he said right i think i was just just shy of 12. i think i was coming 12 like the next month and um i'm my birthday's in september so um when he goes back to school it's sort of September. It's I was going to be twelve. So he's like, right, okay. You want to be you want to be in the business? Is that what you want to do? You think you can do this? So I was like, well, yeah, of course. I'm doing it now. And he's like, okay, all right. So I'm going to give you until you're eighteen. When you're eighteen, if you can't pay for a third of this stock, and a third of the buildings, and a third of the staff wages, and a third of running this business, if you can't put your third in, because at the time of was working with my brother as well, so there was three of us. This business isn't for you. So then what are you going to do? You've got no qualifications. You've got no GCSEs, A-levels. You've got absolutely nothing going for you at all, apart from you're a failed car salesman. Don't worry about it. I'll be okay. And um, and I did. That's quite a profound conversation to have in the office. What were you always naturally tough at that age, or did you ever, did oh, you ever shed be. a tear? No, no, no. We had to be tough. We, we, it was kind of, um, we were, we were brought up. Me and my brother, very like regimented. You know, get up early, and there's if it was a weekend, you go to work. You know, you, if we were at school, but it was a weekend, you go to work. And when it's school holidays or whatever, what are you doing sitting in the house? Come on, you go to work. What are you doing? You're like, Dan, I'm I'm, I'm eight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, I we enjoyed it. it. It was we enjoyed it. It got to the point where we enjoyed it. So, you know, every morning our door used to open like we were being raided, literally like kicked in. Get up, shake yourself. Get up, shake yourself. That was his words. Get up, shake yourself. Be, I don't know, seven o'clock. Right, get up, get dressed. I don't know. I don't know where we're going today. I don't know what we're doing, but we're obviously doing something. So, um, yeah, it was um, it was life. It's life. You know, I don't get up and go to. I've never gotten up and gone to work, ever. Not one day in my life. It's just, it just life. It's all consuming. It's just life. It's just what you do. 
when you were growing up, um, am I right in saying you were the younger brother yeah. of the two? And uh, your brother, Tom, has gone off and he has Tom Hartley Jr. as his own um, separate entity. Correct. But still, you can still see the connection with names and feeling and yeah, look yeah. and premiumness. When when did that happen on your journey? Were you watching what he was doing, working with your dad as well, and expecting to go in as a trio? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a family business. So um, I used to, I was as close to Tom as I was with my dad growing up. He was probably even more as I got into my teens, my, more of my mentor than what my dad was. Um, we were we went everywhere together. We'd done everything together. Um, and um, his vision for where he, he he got into we were never really into classic cars um, 20 years ago you know when I was a teenager uh, and my brother um, brought the classic car um, side of the business into the business and he was and obviously his knowledge on cars on classic cars is just I've watched some podcasts no it's so far it's superior to anybody in the world mental like ridiculous so obviously that comes through a lot of but you can't there is there's no point one per like three people um committing themselves just to that this is a business and this is a machine and this machine needs business every single day we need the bread and butter if you like to churn it out you know that that pays the wages that pays the bills that moves on so the the supercars, I know I talk quite derogatory about supercars there, but supercars keep keeps the thing going. Where classic cars at the time of that caliber. Of that caliber, add. you might do you might do one or two a month. You know, we're trying to do one or two a day. Do you think um and I, I say I've only uh, watched your brother online, I've never met him in the flesh, but I've obviously known you. Mm -hmm. And to me, you move at this tempo. Mm -hmm. It really is that tempo constantly. Would you say that your brother is more moves at that tempo and is a little bit more into that world because he can take the time to analyze those I cars think, and suck up. He really enjoys that bit. I think as fast as I move in the predominantly the business that I'm in, he would be absolutely the equivalent in his business, but it's impossible to move that, to fast. Move that fast. It's impossible. You can't, you physically can't because of the because of the ilk of car that you're buying and selling and because of the the information you need to gather on that car and the proof of the information you need to gather on that car you can't do it but i'm trying to gather um because it's fascinating to understand about different personalities in a family business and it was funny i used to i used to have some fabulous rows with my old man usually mm -hmm. about stock control but then agree on other things perfectly mm -hmm. and what I'd love to understand is, do, do you think, not that, I wouldn't doubt that you could do it, but would you enjoy selling a classic with that period of time before it's moved on, well, before it's gone? Would, or would that drive you a little bit? Yeah, well, yeah, it does. Um, I mean, our business percentage wise would go 75% um, modern supercar, hypercar, 25% classic car. If we've got 60 cars in stock, we've probably got 45 modern supercars and then we've probably got 15 classic cars if that makes sense so um you can you can maintain that pace because i'm still doing other things still doing the modern cars all the time but yeah i would rip my hair out if i you know for me a long deal is 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 not a good deal it's frustrating and um i had a conversation yesterday with somebody over a car a very expensive car i'm buying at the minute and I spoke to him. I tried to buy this car 12 months ago. And 12 months ago, the guy, he was on and on whether he really wanted to sell it. And I think it needed me to offer him what he wanted for him to realize that he didn't want to sell it. Okay. You know, there was no excuse At that point. to not sell the car apart from I don't want to sell the car. So that was the case. He messaged me yesterday, Carl, I want to sell this car. So I said, no, you don't. Because you want the car and you want the money. You want both. And you, you can't have both. No, I do. I want to sell it. So I gave him another offer for it. And he was like, okay, I'm going to get back to you. I said, no. No, you won't get back to me. You've got one hour. So he's like, well, how can you say that? You know, I need to mull it over. I was like, well, mull it over for an hour. Call your wife. Call your 
whoever you need to call, speak to your sons, see if they're okay with your son. I don't care who you call. You've got one hour. If you don't call me in an hour, deal's off. If you want to call me in two hours, we can renegotiate. And he just laughed and he went, fuck, I love you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but is that always the case? Or is no, that really that's, su- that's, with, that's, with, that's because of the experience really su- I had. Has that really surprised some clients the way you sometimes are with them? I'd never be like that to somebody who I haven't always had that experience with. You know, going back 12 months ago, this guy, this deal went on for two weeks, you know. And it got to the point where I was like, I can't keep this offer open to, forever. You told me he's going to let me know the day after. It's been two weeks now. So when he called me yesterday, I'm not going through this again. You know, I'm not, you're not wasting another two weeks of my life on this car. I've done everything you wanted me to do. I even, was, I even agreed to give you the price that you asked me for. And you still drug me down the line for two weeks. I'm not doing it. So if you want to sell it, tell me how much you want for it. He said, well, I want what I wanted last year. Even though we're in a worse market now than what we were last year. I said, okay, you got it. Let me know in an hour. And he did. And he did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's coming into stock. Yeah. How So how quickly now then, because that's very in the moment, how quickly will that piece of stock now arrive? It's on its way back. It's already on its way back. Yeah. See, this is the thing, and I'll, I'll tell everybody a story, and it will lead to um quite a profound <laughs> question, which is when uh, I was in a situation once in between selling our previous business and um leaving it, where I had a couple of cars I really needed to sell ASAP, which puts me on the back foot because I need to get out of them, which was a 458 Spider and um, Range Rover Sport SVR at the time. And it's funny because I think where you guys have pulled such a significant edge is I think I either called or messaged car in the morning. He was at my house two hours away within about three, four hours, stood on the drive. Within 20 minutes after that, we were upstairs having a cup of tea. The deal was done. I was fairly happy. <laughs> <laughs> but And then we drove it back together so I could drive it one more time because it was actually one of yeah, my dad's Yeah, you come cars. back here, didn't you? I yeah. did because I yeah. wanted to drive that car one more yeah, yeah, time because yeah, it, it was a yeah. little bit more than, than what. And it was, it was crap for me because I really didn't want to sell them at that yeah. time, but I had to. Financial circumstance dictated. But we still ended up having a nice time. Is it difficult to do a deal sometimes when you have a really good relationship, really like someone, but you just, you've got to just constantly think about the number that you offer for the business? Look, business comes first, always. Always business comes first. And you can, you can pay too much for diamonds. You know, you, 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 everyone's got a line. The seller has a line where they will not accept anything underneath that line. The buyer has a line where he is not going to pay any more than that line. Now, that line could vary 5%. In both people's eyes, you know, they could think, right, the car's worth a hundred. You know, I like Ben. The car's a good spec. Always got suspension lifter. I didn't think he had that. I might go to 105. So you got that 5% of wiggle room. And at the same time, I think the seller's got the same scenario where they have, right, I want a hundred thousand for my car. I've called up three people. Two of them haven't come back to me yet. I'm still waiting for them to come back to me. Carl's on my drive. I like him. He's going to pay me now. I might take 95. It's that 5% that is and a it sweet was, number. The, the money was in my account within five minutes. Yeah. It's mad that such a basic thing, really, for such a high value good, reactability and speed of transferring and paying for the vehicle can have so much sway because i remember i've contacted dealers since trying to buy cars you some of them on a supercar you cannot get an answer out of for two to three days no what else are they doing why is it so complicated why is buying and selling it's not a house there's no checks that need to be done you do a hpi check on the car you do um various service history checks. These take 20 minutes. You've got the right contacts. If I'm buying a Lamborghini from you, I get the chassis number, I call up Lamborghini. I find out it was serviced three months ago. What did you find when it was there? Is the mileage okay? Yeah, the mileage is fine. What did you do on the service? We'd done a six-year service. We knew exactly what we needed to do. Was the car fine? Yeah, it was fine. What was the mileage? 1,700. Oh, it's 1,800 now. Job done. What more do I need to do? Keep it simple. And all these deals that you've done, just like the deal you've done with me, they all end up, we can see, because the minute, I suppose, I don't know if you ever get this, but the minute then the customer will always then look to see what you've listed it for online afterwards and can roughly see what each deal kind of makes in terms of profitability and margin. 
I'm guessing in your earliest years, you learned that stuff was going quite well and you started to make that money and you made that third that mm-hmm. you had to put in the biz- into the business by the mm-hmm. time you were 18. When did you buy your first really silly toy or do something for yourself and why? Um, well, you know, I lived quite a... Um, I lived quite a strict, um, financially strict life until I'd done my job, as in put my third in for the, for the business, you know? Because I knew what the main goal was to be. You know, at 15, 16 years old, like I had plenty of money. I could have went and bought no end of supercars or watches or whatever I wanted to do. But the main objective was to get the job done. So obviously you have to discipline yourself and, and that that was what that was what I'd done. Um I bought loads of stupid things since. <laughs> <laughs> I bought loads of stupid things. What since. do you reckon the first car <laughs> was I ever saw you in with the car plate on? Um, first car you ever seen me in, I would say would probably be about 2014. 16. 16. I went through a stage where I had loads of Aventadors between that time. So it was no, probably... It was was a Veyron. It was at yeah. the services before the season opener, mate, to SCD. Yeah. And you pulled up in the Veyron. Yeah. A Bugatti Veyron. Yeah. What gave you the spark for that you had to do that? Um, it was, that was another kind of, um, another, I would say a goal, but I feel like when someone sets a goal, they leave space to fail because they think, oh, that was a goal didn't quite get there yet but it's okay because it's still my goal i think when you treat something as a necessary you i have to do this by the time i'm 28 29 30 whatever it may be you put more pressure on yourself and things happen if you if you if you believe it can happen it can happen and i remember i was in the car one day i had an aventador and um obviously we've had no end of veyrons and paganis in and out the showroom over the years and I'm driving my wife somewhere, and I said, you know what? I was 27. Yeah, I was 27. I said, you know what? I said, I want to buy a Veyron, you know. So she's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I like them. She never had a clue what one was at the time. <laughs> so um, she said, when? I said, before I'm 30, I said, I'll have a Veyron. Eight months later, I had a Veyron. I wasn't even 28. And that was because I, that was that was my aim. It wasn't a goal. It was necessary. And also, you know, you have to make a statement sometimes and tell people why you're the best supercar dealer in Europe. So if it was necessary, mm-hmm. how would you have coped if you hadn't have done it? We'll never know. Then there's not been a situation like that. Because with all these things, there's so many high points. There's buying a Bugatti Veyron, achieving mm-hmm. the goal, doing it, doing deals when you're younger, smashing it, having people work for you, getting the third in the business. It's all making a statement, bang, 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 bang. From the outsiders looking in, thinking, well, hang on a second, I've run this business or I've tried this and I've always had the downfall. What I try and get across is the fact that it's not always 100%. You no, actually have to but overcome some really But there's so many moments. downfalls on the way. You, it's nothing ever goes smoothly. It's all there's always downfalls. And can I read you a headline that I found on the internet? Okay, that could be a moment to talk about. Okay, millionaire sports car dealer, thirty two, who starred in first cut supercars, is banned from driving after crashing his hundred and eighty thousand pound Ferrari into an eighty k Porsche while racing around a roundabout at sixty eight mile an hour. That is from Mail. Definitely valued that came in too much, and I think you'd agree. Yeah. But <laughs> that wasn't my best day. No, that wasn't my best day. What went through your head, and and what is that? What is that story? Was that a reset moment? Did that? Did that? Do you know what it was? You? It's 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 a scenario where um, it was um, number one. I know everyone expects me to say this, but number one, we weren't racing. If you were racing in a Cayman GTS and a Ferrari 458 Spider, you're not doing 68 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Do you agree? I agree. Okay. Doing 68 miles an hour in either one of those cars is the equivalent to doing about 24 miles an hour in a Corsa. Your, your stopping time is probably the same, if not faster. 
but the audience will also understand myself included as a supercar owner and there'll be performance car owners all sorts of owners we do we, we are car people but the speed limit was 60 it was yeah. a dual carriageway speed limit was 60 and I was doing 68 so you were sentenced to a nine month prison sentence suspended for 24 months in order to complete 200 hours of unpaid work mm-hmm. and lost your driver's license and at that point Am I right in saying you had the Pagani or you had... No, I had... I had the Veyron at that point. No, that, that was a transitional point. I had the Veyron at the start and a year later I bought the Pagani, which I did not drive for one year. Just looked at it as a bit Just of had to look at it. That's um, a nephew to the system. Isn't yeah, it? well, you know, it, it, it is and it's not. That was just... Okay, let's put this into context for a second. And this was kind of words that came out of the the um the cs's mouth really um if this would have been joe bloggs in his volkswagen golf and his mate in his fiesta with all the same statistics speeds everything no one would know none the wiser it's just another accident that's all it is but because it's read it again millionaire sports car dealer that's what i'm saying 32, I mean, who starred in First Cut Supercars. So that sells papers, no? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, of course. So, and the car was a... Ferrari. And what did I hit? A Porsche. There you go. So that was... Everything worked against me there. There's, th- there'll be three accidents today that have exactly the same ilk as that in lower cars with people who are not quite as well known and no one hears about it. Did that dent your confidence a bit though? And what, how did, what did that do for... Because obviously, as you've mentioned before, I had to do it. It's a necessity. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to prove I am the best car dealer. Mm-hmm. That's going to hurt someone's ego. Oh, no. It, um, all that does, something like that, is it adds something negative for someone negative to say. You know? Someone who is negative towards somebody will always find negative things to say. You don't have to, you don't have to give it to them. And what I'd done there is I gave someone something negative to throw back at me if they wanted to. Did you find it annoying though and irritating? And also the, I have one question here, which is in between it happening mm-hmm. and maybe being sentenced and thinking, shit, I actually have lost my license. Mm-hmm. Did you ever think you're a little bit untouchable that that no. wouldn't happen just because of the success that yeah, no, your way? Yeah, n- no, not at all. Not at all. Um, I, I, I knew that this is a serious inconvenience and this could affect how I do business because let's be totally honest with you. If you take me away from this business or my father away from this business, this business is no longer this business. You could pass it on to somebody else and they can't make it work the way we can. So by me not being able to um, physically stand in front of somebody and deal with them, like I, like I did with you that day, um, Things you can you can lose out on business. It can cost you money. So obviously, I employed a, a full time driver who just drove me everywhere. And the guys, the guy was a legend. His hours that he put in, obviously, they were my hours. Um, I don't think of anybody else's. Um, I don't feel like anybody else, like my driver, had another life outside of work because he had to drive me all day, every day, on my hours that I work, which is my life. The guy never had time. For two years, he didn't have time I, I to be alive. Steve sat over there behind the deck who, who uh, takes the podcast everywhere every hour of the day, M- maybe feeling some similarities yeah. to that guy. But right you, don't, you don't sit back and consider that like, this guy, this guy's got a life, you know? And obviously he was, he was, he was absolutely great. He's but then is that just work. business? But it's business. Of course it is. He, he knew what he was signing up for. And that's that's how I came up. That's how I got over the whole not having a license situation. But, you know, yeah, it was a massive inconvenience. Um, did I deserve the outcome that I got? Um, I deserve some outcome, obviously. Um, I obviously wasn't driving with due care and attention. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had a crash. I wasn't driving safely because I wouldn't have had a crash. To, to be honest, I... I put I put my hands up. I I'm surprised something like that hasn't happened to me at some point. Yeah. Once and just had that one moment that's tipped. Well, to be fair, I did hit a deer. 
<laughs> oh, did you? I spanked a deer in my purple mantle at about 90 mile an hour. I'd have a new front bumper. I was going to say, you must have nearly ripped the car off. On track, sorry. <laughs> I just, <laughs> on track, it come out onto the track and I was about to do it. It was, it was a big one. Uh, it needed yeah. a new, new front bumper, the coolant resin wire smashed on the front it was fine it was just external it really yeah, yeah. It just clipped it on the edge like like when you kick a football like yeah, <laughs> on yeah, yeah. A, uh, and it, it just clipped it and almost like teed this deer off into the field <laughs> and um but th- that was a moment that that could have gone really bad you know the car sliding off into the hedge or on the these, road these, and all the rest these, of it anyone it who owns a supercar can relate to what i'm about to say you know none of us are perfect you don't get in a car every day and you don't drive as if you're taking your driving test every day. People use their phones. People don't wear a seatbelt. People maybe have a conversation with someone at the side of them. They might speed over the speed limit slightly. We all do it. It's just one of those things. And that day was, um, that day just wasn't a good day. But I'm human and that that's what happens. I've been, I've, I've been driving over 100,000 miles in a car every year for 17 years for 19 years it's a lot of miles so an accident here and there again you know once every 17 19 years it's it's, gonna happen it's gonna happen no i i I agree with that it's gonna happen it's more i was more interested to find out about what that did on your if that did anything to you to be like oh that really was shit like something can come out the blue here and hit us but that I'm, we I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm used to that. I've been in business since I've been a child. You know, you're used to curveballs and you're used to hurdles being chucked in your way. You know, you, not everything. You don't get up every morning and come to work and sell a car and do a deal and earn money and go home and then do the next thing the next day. It doesn't happen. You, you're in business. You know exactly the same thing. Anybody who's in business knows the same thing. It's not all roses. When you were learning from your dad in that office on the stool in the corner... And subsequently, through your teenage years, still teaching, but learning your dad as well. Social media wouldn't be really a thing. It wasn't a thing. And then I think it was in 2011, 2012, Instagram come about. Uh, and then stuff really started. And I was late to the party with that. Go uphill. Obviously, where you've learned a lot and taken on a lot from your dad and from your brother and learned different skills and all come together. Was that, did you ever have to show that? world to your dad yeah oh yeah 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 no he he um he was not a uh he was he thought i was an idiot um posting cards on social media making videos doing this kind of thing he was like what are you doing so i'm trying to explain to him you try and explain to a 60 year old scotsman <laughs> instagram do you know what i mean who by the way didn't go to school and is completely illiterate and completely mm. dyslexic so you know but now he sees what it does, and he doesn't come off. But and you know what's funny? He doesn't come off of it. It's funny. I don't think there's anybody that can replicate your dad online, <laughs> just because we're not sixty and yeah. all the rest of it. Well, do you know what? So I, I it's funny point. because he posts different content to anyone else can yeah, create. Yeah. Because we wouldn't think to do it like that in a way, if you know what I mean. At one point, his assistant, I gave her all his passwords to his like Twitter and um, social media and all that kind of stuff. And I said, you, you have to have a notification when he posts something and you have to read it through. And if you don't like it, you got to delete it because what's politically correct, especially going through your 2015, 16, 17 kind of time world's changing a lot. And the views of a, someone who's extremely old fashioned, from a, a, from a different world to millennials. He's from a different world. And you've just got to make sure that everyone's happy with what you've just posted, you know? Because he... he um, although, Otherwise you could end up with a highlight like that in the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, um, one of them's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need any more. But no, but now he gets to grips with it. He's, he's, he has so many people. So many people come up to me and say, oh, you know what? I absolutely love your dad on social media I'm so glad somebody just says what's on their mind and doesn't worry about what people people say he says what they want to say but they can't or they don't because they're scared to and he does he doesn't care and it's obviously worked because he had a lifetime achievement award for the work that you've all done yeah well you know he, he he's just um he's I would say he's one in a million but he's one in eight billion I would say but when you've achieved that 
like your dad, no doubt you'll be working towards the same achievements, awards, notices at some point in the very near future. You've got, you've had the Veyron, you've had the Huayra, you've done every deal probably there is under the sun, traded with every country. Where is there to go? How do you look for new things to do and encourage you and to find out and go? Because you've got all the money you could ever need. You keep doing the next deal, the next deal. In your past life, there was always something to aim for. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to buy that third in the business. I'm going to get that Veyron. I'm going to get that Huayra. Okay, I've lost my license. I will get it back. What's Where's the next thing to aim for? Well, the business is always expanding and it has been. I've seen a, a big expansion in the last sort of seven or eight years. Um, you know, we made the we made the decision to build the the. I keep calling it the new showroom. It's not new anymore. It's not new anymore. It <laughs> always will be the new showroom yeah, yeah, until yeah. it's the last showroom. Exactly. But, you know, there's there's something that might be happening in the next 12 or 18 months in another location, possibly, um, and see where that goes. And then after that, you know, I think we need to possibly even maybe look abroad. And is that a massive factor? Because you can ship a car all over the world, but is it that going to give you that reactability in the same way that you're at my place within three hours, you can pick the car up, you can do whatever? Is that what that's for? I think it's I think it's um, taking advantage of being a brand and not a business. We are now a brand. People want to come and buy a car from Tom Hartley Cars because everyone's heard of it. You know, I recently... Well, I've, I've been in Saudi Arabia for the last few days, as you know, because I've done some business with one of the princes over there who invited me to go to the Grand Prix. And his words to me was, I always wanted to buy a car from Tom Hartley Cars. This is a prince in Saudi Arabia. I'm guessing you sold him one. I sold him one. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. not going over there yeah. and not No, I sold him one before. Be- before I went over. Okay. He invited me after we'd done the deal. Amazing. So, you know... S- it's quite hard. I would never think that. I would never comprehend that, that these kind of people in these positions, you know, they, he could have bought the car from anywhere else in the UAE. You know, Dubai's, Dubai's got every car in the world and that's literally a, a short plane flight away. But he wanted to buy a car from us and he wanted to meet me and he wanted to do the deal that way. And you have bought and sold cars from all over the world. And I remember, and I won't, I'm not going to cover it on this because I've seen it covered before on podcasts, but you bought your Veyron from Russia. In... No, I bought it from Vienna off of a Russian. Vienna off of a Russian. Yeah. Dodgy deal in a car yeah. park. Did you see the picture I posted recently on that? No, I didn't. You can get it up for uh, me and show the camera. Uh, do you know what? I was going through um, some, old, some old pictures and um, it came up. Like as a memory on this day in 2016, like it came up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I posted it because I was like, "Oh, I've not seen that picture." So this is at two two a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and back then, that car was like God. That was. I mean, I had so much going through my mind at that point. I just I had a turbo a nine nine one, Gen one, Turbo S. And I left it at Luton Airport with the keys underneath the wheel right at, right outside the entrance of Luton Airport because I was running that late to catch the plane to Vienna to buy this car. I'm thinking, is that even still there? I'm at, it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm at an underground car park with two Russian guys, one who cannot speak English whatsoever. And I'm thinking, am I going to get out of this car park? Like, I'm, I'm not going to make it out. If I send them the money, are they going to give me the car? You know, there's so much going through your mind, but, you know, you've got to throw, throw caution to the wind sometimes and go with your gut. A deal is always a deal, whether you're buying or selling. And you made it very clear that it's all about the deal. Business comes first. Mm -hmm. We live in a world where there's wars raging, um, terrible atrocities going on in different countries across the world. And that's usually because of key individuals or stems from key individuals. In this business, you do deal with princes, world leaders, mad individuals, some of which you can never name. Mm -hmm. Is there a line, though, that you will never do business with one or two particular individuals in the world. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. There's, it's not just world leaders or or people like that. If I find somebody who I know and I know how they've mistreated people that I know in the past or, or for some reason have come across as somebody that I don't want to do business with, 
I'm fortunate enough to, I'm not a whore, basically. If I don't want to do business with somebody, which is very rare, but if I don't, I won't. Is Russia difficult to do business with now? But you can't. You just, it's physically impossible. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't. It's a mad world that we live in. Mad world that we live in because stuff like that changes all the time. One minute it's open, next minute it's closed for six years. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the whole the whole Russian situation kind of um, kind of hindered the UK car market a bit because uh, Rolls Royce and certain other brands publicly said that we're not selling any cars to Russia. Russia's a Russia's a continent, <laughs> you know. It's, but it's not just the place; it's the people. There's because because there's a lot there's a lot of Russian yeah, yeah, of in course. the UK. Yeah, yeah. But we had or all, all their allocations were scattered across the world, but the UK had most of their allocations. So when cars were extremely hard to get and making premiums and making over lists because there was chips you couldn't get or there was supply and demand issues that you couldn't fix, we literally had a country the size of a continent's orders and said, Right. There's another 150 Rolls Royce Cullinans coming in this quarter, and that just that just killed Rolls Royce completely. And just the ass fell out of it. Just killed it. They were no longer hard to get. They were giving them away, or well, giving them away compared to what cars were making in COVID. How far out can you usually see when something like that's going to happen to the market? Because we sit in bits where deals must be either flying off your desk or mm-hmm. whether they're flipping hard to work for. Mm-hmm. You must have these moments where you think. God, this was so much easier six months ago. Yeah, you know, you, all the rest of it. Yeah, you, you get a sense for it. Yeah, Is that part of the whole thing now? Of course, it's this experience. You know, you you experience it, and the, you, you there's when things are really, really, really good. You know, round the corner, literally round the corner, there's going to be a massive dip, and you've got to be ready for it. Do you view a lot of the other main main privately owned supercar? dealerships in the uk do you view them as competitors or do you think you operate in a completely different way um you're on about the independent dealerships yep let's go with i don't i don't, I don't, let's don't go look with at... a couple of controversial ones gve amari no um, they're not competition to me they're not competition no 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 they're not they're not no no, no. red lines uh romans romans i have a lot of respect for romans um we do business very differently i think we do business differently to everybody across the board anyway but um I go back a long, well, us as a family go back a very, very long way with the with the Jack and Ellie family. Got a lot of time, a lot of respect for them, and you know, only support them when, when and where we can. Have you ever fallen out with either someone that you're close to that you'd like to make a relationship with, or even a, a brother, a family member, over who gets what car? No, because that must be challenging sometimes. Because if you if I if you've got a a classic been offered to you, mm-hmm. will you take it or will you put it over no, I'll take to it. your brother? I'll take it. Of and is that, that's always the arrangement. I, but me and my brother do business together. You know, at the minute I'm trying to sell a McLaren 675 LT and take in a Ferrari Daytona. Now I'm happy to have the Daytona, but I know that he has got someone for a Daytona. So literally before you turned up, we had a conversation where, Tom, if I get this deal done, I'll just send the Daytona to you. You sell it to your man, and this is what I need back, and you take whatever you choose. It's the way it is. That's business. Good business is fair business. Amazing. I think it's been amazing to hear your story of how you've developed into the person that you are today, how you learned from your father, Tom, how you learned from your father, your brother, and how you've also developed your own style and strategy and how you can flip cars on social media and be the first person to anything. I guarantee if somebody messaged all the dealers in the country and said, there's this car for sale with a price tag on the window, come and drop the cash off on the bonnet if it's the right amount, somehow you would be there first, yeah. even if it was by helicopter, even yeah. if you were the furthest away i guarantee yeah. it so thank you so much for coming on and telling us your story thank you telling us how you got to where you are today and i look forward to one day catching up with you in the future when you've done a lot more interesting business and opened up in some crazy well places. next time we meet you'll be collecting your new car <laughs> <laughs> love it Cheers, thank you girl. mate thank, thank you. you good to see you again <laughs>